So even though I know David pretty well, I did print out your little introduction to make sure I got everything correct. Um, but David has transitioned his home, a post and beam farmhouse built in 1828, entirely off of fossil fuels and designed heat pump systems for hundreds of other households in Maine. He is a certified energy manager and lead accredited professional for building design and construction. He is joining College of the Atlantic as their new director of energy starting in August. And I won't take it personally, but he did not also include that uh, David is the vice chair of policy for Sierra Club Maine's executive committee. So I will uh, pass it over to David. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And actually, it, it seems like a small enough group. Um, we could go around and do introductions. Um, if you could each uh, give your name, what town you're, you live in, your pronouns, and what your current heat sources are in your house. So I'm David Gibson. I live in Morrill. I use he, him pronouns. And my house is primarily heated with heat pumps with a high efficiency wood stove as backup and uh, for beautiful ambiance on cold winter nights. Um, Sarah, if you want to give a quick intro and, and then we'll go around. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Sarah Layton, as I mentioned, chapter director for Sierra Club Maine. I'm in a rental right now until I find a permanent housing place. Uh, so my rental, unfortunately, is heated with oil and there's no alternative fuel uh, heat source. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to my new home being more energy efficient. And I'm in Searsport. And uh, John Beal. Um, I'm in Belfast. Uh, I'm him. Uh, the house I live in is uh, heated primarily by a chip boiler with backup wood stove and heat pump. Uh, Jim Hatch. <clears throat> Hi, I'm uh, in Bristol, 1875 vintage house. <clears throat> I recently installed two heat pumps, um, which are doing a great job, but I still have part of the house that I rely on oil. Um, Brown. Not sure who that is. Um, if you're if you're there and want to unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Um, all right, uh, Jim Child. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I'm here with my wife Pam, and we're in Bristol. Uh, our house was built in 1829, and it's heated with an oil-fired furnace. And what else did you need to know? Uh, just what pronouns you use. Oh, well, he and, he and she, <laughs> and or us. <laughs> uh, David? Hi, I, I live in Reno, Nevada right now, but I am moving to Portland, Maine, because my son lives there. And uh, I know David quite well. He was vice chair of the uh, Toyabi chapter when I was chair. Uh, so looking forward to seeing him again. Um, my son lives in a uh, circa 1980 house in South Portland. Uh, it's uh, heated by oil fire, fired burner. So um, maybe there's something I can do about that. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Sue Inches. Oh, hi, David. Um, I am coming to you from North Yarmouth. And you can see the post and beams over my head here, uh, live in an 1828 um, Cape farmhouse myself. And um, we are mostly propane here. We have um, heating, uh, clothes drying, uh, hot water and everything is propane with a big bulk tank in the back of the house. And then we did put a heat pump in, we have a shop in our basement and we put a heat pump in there uh, right around March, um, which seems to be working really well. So, but the rest of the house is, um, it's more of a challenge, heating wise. So uh, that's what we've got here. Um, Becky, if you want to introduce yourself, we're just giving our name, town, pronouns, and heating sources. Hi, I'm um, I'm Becky Bartovic, and I live in a um, I live on North Haven Island in an 1867 farmhouse that we super insulated and. Um, it is, uh, I have a heat pump that I installed, I think 
four years ago and a heat pump hot water heater and I have taken out the furnace and um, I have solar on my barn and so I have no oil um, or any fossil fuel in my house. And I am alive to tell you about it. I, um, I, do, um, <laughs> I do have a wood stove. Um, I'm reading a lot about uh, wood stoves. It's a highly efficient wood stove, but of course I'm causing particulates um, as a result of that. Um, and different people argue differently about, about the carbon footprint of wood stoves, but uh, I only, it's a, high, it's a very um, heavy soapstone stove. And uh, so I only burn it after dark and uh, my house is heated by the sun mostly when it's sunny out. So anyway, uh, what else did you want? Oh, oh, she, hers, and I live on Penobscot occupied territory. Thank you. Um, Patricia? So I'm up here in Fort Kent um, with an oil boiler and a pellet stove in a 1950s vintage house. Um, and my parents are actually moving up here as well. And they're in, gonna be in a very new house with uh, propane radiant floors. Let's see if I can turn them over at all. Awesome. And uh, who is on the iPhone? Would you like to introduce yourself? All right. Um, well, I'll, I'll get started. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the, for the great introduction. Um, and, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Hopefully, none of you are using any of your heat sources uh, in this beautiful weather. Um, I haven't opened up windows yet, but hopefully this afternoon it'll be warm enough to have some windows open. Uh, so three and a half years ago, my wife and I bought a new house, our, our home here in Morrill. Um, it's an old post and beam farmhouse that was built in 1828. Um, this is the front of the barn that is visible from Route 3. If you're driving between Augusta and Belfast, you have driven right by our house. Um, so first, unrelated to heat pumps, I highly recommend changing all of your light bulbs to LEDs. Um, this waste can on the left is all of the incandescent light bulbs that we took out of our basement attic, uh, the house and the barn. Um, I found some 150 watt incandescent light bulbs out in a barn. It's it very expensive if you have those types of light bulbs and you leave the lights on over a weekend or you know that sort of thing. So it's well worth changing all your lights to LEDs. We also replaced our shower heads with low flow fixtures that use a lot less water. Um, and the primary savings there is the electricity or heating oil or propane that you're using to heat your water. Um, so again, highly recommend uh, lower flow shower heads to conserve water. Um, we also, uh, we, when we, we bought a fridge and we made sure to get an Energy Star rated fridge um, and I encourage high efficiency appliances as well. Um, we also put in a heat pump water heater that I, I don't have a picture of in this slideshow. Um, but again, just starting with efficiency and, and reducing energy consumption. Um, and so before we talk about installing heat pumps, um, it's essential to reduce the heat loss out of your home first. Uh, home efficiency is, is a critical first step. It doesn't matter what you're heating with, whether it's heating oil or propane or a wood stove or heat pumps. Uh, if, if you have a leaky old farmhouse, um, you're wasting a lot of energy heating the great outdoors rather than uh, heating your home. And with heat pumps, that becomes even more efficient because you want to have the system properly sized. And I, I don't think it's possible to size a heat pump for a leaky farmhouse that the wind blows through on a cold winter day. So um, air sealing and insulating is the first step. Uh, this is uh, a, a EPA or Department of Energy graphic showing common sources of air leaks in the house. Um, and, and then on the right is a blower door. Um, and a blower door is the most important tool that a professional energy auditor will use. It helps to identify where air leaks are occurring in your home. 
um, and also quantifies the, the magnitude of the air leakage. So you can get a before and after and understand how much you've reduced the air leakage out of your house, uh, which, which makes a big difference and also can help you to identify if, if you've missed some um, doing, doing a test out after, after doing air sealing. Um, and sometimes you can do air sealing on your own if you, if you know where there are leaks. Um, like, like for instance, this was next to the chimney in our house. It's, it's very common for there to be huge air leaks around chimneys. And while you want the flue gases and, uh, and all of that to go up and out the chimney, you don't want a bunch of warm air leaking out of your house alongside it. Um, the orange spray foam is, is fire block or fire rated spray foam, uh, but many other air leaks in other locations, you can use canned spray foam or caulk or other, other types of materials that are common at any hardware store to seal up air leaks um, if you want to do it yourself or hiring an energy auditor. And the big benefit with the energy auditor is that often they'll use the blower door to guide where to seal and so helping to make sure that you're getting the biggest leaks and, and prioritizing um, and, and not wasting dozens of hours of time trying to chase down little tiny leaks and making sure that you're getting the most heat, the, the most air leakage for, for, for your effort. Um, and our crawl space, we have a basement under half the house and a crawl space under half. Um, and the crawl space had field stone foundation walls um, and so we put down a vapor barrier, a plastic layer to prevent ground moisture from getting into the house um, and then spray foam the walls down there to um, fully seal and insulate the field stone walls. I'm, I'm not really aware of any other way to uh, seal and insulate a field stone foundation wall. Um, I know many of us in the environmental community don't love spray foam. It is a product made from petrochemicals um, that is getting better. Um, the newer spray foam formulations have a greenhouse gas equivalent of CO2 versus older formulations that were 1400 times worse in terms of their global warming potential. Um, so it is important to use the, the newer HFO type uh, spray foam. Um, and, and again, this is something that you're much better off having, hiring a contractor to do um, they do sell do-it-yourself kits at Home Depot, um, and I have heard mixed reviews on those. Uh, so anyway, I highly recommend air sealing your home. Uh, and then the energy auditor will also use an infrared camera, um, which can help to identify places where there's insulation that's missing um, or, or other heat loss out of the house. Um, and then you can blow in a whole bunch of insulation in your, in your walls and attic. Uh, this is this is our attic uh, with cellulose insulation, um, and it is really important to air seal before you add more insulation because if there are air leaks in, especially in the attic, warm air rising in your home and then leaking out, and then uh, it compromises the value of the insulation. If there insulation works by trapping little pockets of air, and uh, and if there is air passing through it, then it compromises that, and so you're both losing the heat that. Uh, is leaking out through the air leak as well as the heat that the insulation should be trapping. Um, so I highly, again, highly, highly recommend having an energy audit and then air sealing and improving insulation as much as possible before transitioning to heat pumps for heating. Uh, we also uh, installed window dressers in our windows. Um, this is a great way to improve the efficiency of older windows. Um, thankfully, the previous owners had put double pane windows in everywhere in our house, um, but the, the window dressers still make a significant difference. Um, I've seen frost on the inside of our double pane windows on a cold winter morning, and with the window dressers, it stays basically room temperature on that interior surface, so it feels a lot warmer in the, in the room and uh, helps for, to prevent both air leakage directly around the window um, if it's not sealing properly and uh, traps a layer of air to, to insulate the window space. Um, and and for, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Window Dressers is a nonprofit organization based in Rockland and they have builds all around the state. 
um, and community members help to build the inserts and they require everyone who is getting inserts to volunteer time helping to build them. So it's a great community experience um, as well as uh, an awesome way to improve the efficiency of your home. And because it's all volunteer effort, it's very cost effective. Um, I think it was like 500 bucks for window dressers for all of our windows in the house um, versus uh, a single replacement window can be close to that by the time you pay a contractor to install it. Um, so some things to think about before, uh, before installing heat pumps or before replacing your heating system. Uh, what are your goals for the project? Um, it, are you intending it to be your primary heat system in the house? Um, like, like Becky, are you trying to replace your, your furnace and, and eliminate your heating oil system altogether? Or are you trying to supplement an existing system, at, which can be either if you, if you have a heat pump in the, in the main portion of your house, it can offset maybe 70 or 80% of your, of your heating fuel and then using your other system for some of the peripheral areas, bedrooms and things like that. Um, or if there's cold rooms in your house, um, I've seen them installed just to improve comfort in a, in a portion of the house that isn't being adequately heated. Um, and, uh, and then are you trying to reduce costs or improve comfort or um, you know, just understanding what the goals are um, so that you can convey what your goals for the system are to a contractor? It's, it's kind of a different project if you're replacing your primary heat system versus uh, adding, adding something supplemental. Um, heat pumps work very differently than most combustion heating appliances. Uh, most combustion systems are designed, whether, whether that's a boiler or a furnace, most of them are designed to be able to reheat the entire space of the house very quickly. Um, the, the thought being that if you come in on a cold day and your heat system has been turned down, you want to be able to bump up the thermostat and get it 70 degrees in your house within 15 minutes. Um, and heat pumps do not work that way. Um, they're meant to run continuously. Uh, so you generally don't want to set the temperature back when you leave or at night, you want to let it just run continuously and it, and it maintains the temperature in the space. Uh, heat pump systems generally have a much lower heating capacity. Um, they're, they're much more of a low and slow um, versus a hot and fast uh, type of heat. Uh, and so they won't reheat your house quickly. If you turn the temperature down five degrees, it could take a few hours to reheat the space depending on what the outside temperature is. Um, the heat pump also, uh, while they do blow air around and they, and they are fairly effective at distribution, uh, is more similar to a wood stove in terms of a central point of, of heating uh, versus baseboard heat or, or ducts that are ducted into every room and providing heat in every, every room in the house. Um, and so depending on what your existing heating system is, uh, you'll, you'll find, like, you may find it to be very different. Uh, for, for many of us in Maine that are used to having wood stoves, we, we understand that it's 500 degrees next to the wood stove and uh, it gets progressively colder the further away you are. Um, heat pumps do have a good fan unit and, and blow the heat out. Um, but as, if you have doors closed or um, other obstructions, then the, that inhibits the distribution of heat from the, from the heat pump unit. Um, and then it's also important to think about what, what kind of backup heat you have during a power outage. Um, and while most furnaces and boilers also have electric components and will also lose, you'll lose heat from your boiler or furnace during an outage, um, with, with heat pumps, you, you definitely lose your, your source of heat because they're fully electric. Um, and so having a wood stove or um, a backup generator or uh, another source of energy to, to keep your house warm during power outages um, which we all know how common those are in, in various areas around the state. Um, so just very, very simply, um, heat pumps work uh, by moving, moving heat from one area to another. Um, generally, heat always moves from areas that are hot to areas that are cold. 
Um, and so a heat pump uses a refrigerant to be able to reverse that cycle and force the, the refrigerant to take on heat or release heat when we want it to, um, rather than just having the warm air leaking out of the house over time. Um, and so typically a heat pump system will have an outdoor compressor um, as well as an indoor head for distributing the heat inside. Um, and most of the systems today can be reversed. And so you can flip it to cooling mode in the summertime and they will cool and dehumidify your house in the summer, which is a, an incredible added benefit. Um, that was one of the key things that my wife was looking for. She grew up in Reno and is used to the dry heat in, in the summertime. And so having the humidity of Maine uh, was not her favorite thing. And so adding heat pumps and being able to cool and de dehumidify our house in the summer has been um, an incredible bonus as well. Um, and, and I could get into much more technical detail of how heat pumps work, uh, but I, I didn't think anyone would want that. Uh, the, the key thing here is that you need to have refrigerant lines and electrical that run between the indoor and outdoor unit. So generally they need to be fairly close to each other. Uh, most manufacturers, you can have 50 or 60 feet of refrigerant line. Um, the, the longer that is, the more expensive the system is going to be, the more complicated the installation. Um, and so typically, if you can have them on opposite sides of the same wall, that's, you know, that's going to be the simplest and, and most efficient installation. Um, in terms of locating the compressor outside, um, there's some important considerations to keep in mind. Um, in Maine, it should be at least 24 inches high, uh, potentially higher off the ground up in the county where you get more snow. Um, but the idea is that it's completely out of the snow in the winter time. Uh, if, if it's mounted too low, um, then it, it can freeze and, and just freeze itself shut and stop working. Um, and, and I've heard of that happening, particularly for heat pumps that were just mounted directly on the ground. Um, the heat pump does run a defrost cycle in the winter time, um, and so it doesn't pull heat from inside, but it just reverses the flow of refrigerant for a few minutes to defrost the outdoor, the, the fan unit outside, um, and, and then any moisture that's frozen on will melt off, and so, um, and so it needs to be up off the ground so that, that can run somewhere. And then my, my final note on here is you don't want it right next to a walkway because that water will refreeze and can create a slipping hazard. Um, and so you generally don't want it right next to a, a walkway where, the, uh, where you'll cause ice problems. Um, I recommend putting the, the outdoor unit uh, on a gable end, or if you have an asphalt roof with gutters where there's not gonna be snow sliding off the roof or, or constant water running off the roof, um, that's fine too, um, but you know it's a it's a fairly sophisticated unit, and and while they're designed to be outside in all weather, uh, they're really designed to have 12 or 18 inches of snow slide off your roof on top of it. Um, and then it's also recommended for them to be sheltered from the wind, um, and if if you're on an island that's open and exposed to the ocean on one side, or if you were, you know, our house is in a giant open field until the windbreak we planted two years ago grows up taller. And so uh, having it be sheltered from the wind will improve the efficiency of the unit in the winter time. If the fan has to fight a 40 mile an hour wind, that's gonna, that's gonna cost efficiency for your system. Um, and so for, for our compressor, we actually have a sheltered area under the barn that's open to outside. It, it needs to have full circulation around it for the outside air to exchange heat with, um, but it's sheltered with a rock wall on one side and a concrete wall on another side. And then it's under the barn. So there's no risk of snow or ice sliding down onto it. Um, and so our, our unit, you can see one of the brackets is hung on the concrete wall there. I did take down a little bit to have enough space underneath it, um, but that was the best space in our house. But often they'll just be mounted to the outside of the house. They can either be mounted to a concrete foundation wall um, or on uh, a ground mounted stand with a concrete, 
precast concrete pad and, and some metal brackets to get them up off the ground. Um, generally, they don't recommend mounting them to wooden stud walls because the vibration from the outdoor unit can carry through to inside and can be quite loud inside the house. And so generally we avoid mounting them to wooden stud walls and only to concrete foundations or just mounted on the ground. So some considerations for where to put your indoor unit. Um, the, the biggest question is where do you want the heat? Um, if, there's, if there's a specific area of your house that's cooler that you're trying to add supplemental heat to, then that would guide your decision. Um, if you're trying to have more of a whole house heating system, uh, having, having, a, having the indoor unit centrally located um, where it has good airflow and, and distribution throughout the house. Um, less is more. Um, you're, you're much better, depending on the size and layout of your house, you're much better off having one to three indoor units, not trying to put one in every single room. Um, as, a, as a heat pump designer uh, working for Revision Energy for the last three years, um, we had a lot of customers that were like, oh, we want one in every bedroom and we want one in the kitchen and we want one in the dining room. And no, you don't. Uh, the, you want them to be able to distribute the heat um, and, and blow air around, you know, and, and generally you don't want, you wouldn't want to mount one in a room that's smaller than about 10 by 10 or 12 by 12. Uh, a smaller bedroom is going to be too small. Uh, they, they can have trouble maintaining the temperature if the space is too small. Um, I've seen them put in hallways where, where the owner thought that the heat would rise, like it, like facing into the stairwell and it kind of just short circuits and it's pulling back in the heat. And so it thinks that it's heated the whole space um, when in reality it, it hasn't distributed the heat very well. And so um, the, the bigger and more open the space is, the, the better off the, the system will be. Um, and, they, and they really can distribute heat well in a house, um, but the key is that your, your exterior has to be well insulated and well sealed. Um, it can't compensate for major air leaks in, in a room, and particularly with bedroom doors closed, um, you know, you'll lose a few degrees of temperature by having the bedroom door closed at night. Um, and so you can regulate temperature either by uh, adding a grill into the door to allow more airflow through or leaving doors open. Um, I've seen it work pretty well to have a heat pump in a larger hallway upstairs, and then it distributes into all the rooms when the doors are open. Uh, and anyway, um, generally it's not recommended to have them in every room. And like in our house, our, our house is about 80 feet long and 25 feet wide. And it's all broken up. It's you know poorly designed old farmhouse where it seems like they added rooms at different points. Um, and we have three units in our house, um, a higher capacity unit in the, in the middle of the house in the living room that heats the kitchen and two smaller bedrooms. And then we kind of have a master suite at one end that's pretty isolated otherwise. And so that has its own heat pump in it. And then at the far end of the house, we have an incredibly oversized bathroom and entry area that has a heat pump that, that heats that end of the house to, to supplement. Um, and, and if you want it for cooling, if you have a two-story house, you're gonna wanna have one upstairs, uh, warm air rises and cool air tends to sink. So if you have a heat pump only downstairs and you're trying to cool the house, it's, it's not going to be very effective for the upstairs area. Um, generally, you want to mount the indoor unit on an exterior wall so that the refrigerant lines can go out through the wall and then, and then run on the exterior of the house. Um, I've seen some cases where it works to you know, build an interior chase or run them up in a, or down to the basement or up to the attic in uh, a stairwell or that sort of thing. Um, but usually, again, the more complicated the installation, the more expensive the system is going to be. So if you are trying to find a complicated place to put them, it, it will cost you more upfront. Oh, I didn't realize I can scroll. And, uh, and so they generally require a space, depending on the exact type of indoor unit, they gen the, the typical ones uh, require about 12 inches of, of height and three feet of width to mount them on the wall. 
Um, and then they need to be about six inches below the ceiling. Most of the units will pull air from the room in from above and then blow it out below. Um, and they can be a little, depending on the uh, manufacturer, they can be a little bit closer to the ceiling. Um, different manufacturers have slightly different size units, um, but this is, this is kind of a typical uh, one. This, this is a Mitsubishi heat pump system. Most of the manufacturers are similar sized um, and will have, you know, the, some are a little bit wider, or a little bit taller or that sort of thing. Um, and there are other types of indoor units as well. Um, there's floor mounted ones that tend to be about two feet wide and 18 or 20 inches tall um, that, that mount on the floor, uh, more like a monitor heater um, type of thing. Um, and those, can be effective, particularly if you if you don't have space higher on the wall. Um, and for new construction, you can install uh, ceiling cassettes that recess into the ceiling and and then blow the air down more more like uh, modern air conditioning or, or that sort of thing. Most installers that I know don't like installing those into older homes because you run into all sorts of issues with access and with uh, stud spacing, I've, I've definitely encountered homes. I don't think I've ever been in an older house where the studs were actually spaced evenly 16 inches or 24 inches. There, there's always some variation with that. And if you need a certain amount of space and you're an inch or two shy, um, you just cut a giant hole in your ceiling that now needs to be patched up. Um, and so most installers don't like to install them. Uh, in, in the ceilings of older homes, but for new construction, that's an option. Um, as you can see, um, our cat loves it. Um, we put a little uh, cat stand, a little climbing tree for him. And in the winter, in the morning, he'll be sitting in front of it with the heat just blowing in his face. Um, and generally the heat coming out of them is around 100 to 110 degrees is what I've observed. Um, and it, it varies a little bit depending on the capacity of the unit and, and uh, how, how much heat is being called for. Um, but it's not, it's not a forced hot air coming off of a furnace that can be much warmer than that in some circumstances. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty comfortable heat. Um, I don't know, I get questions about that sometimes. And, and then the fan in the indoor unit has variable speeds as well. So depending on the needs, the, the fan will, you can set it to auto and it'll pick up as needed to distribute the heat more or it'll slow down. In the lower fan speeds, they're very quiet. Um, and there, there can be a little bit more noise. I mean, just like turning up a window fan or that sort of thing, you set it on high and it's gonna be louder than, than if it's on a low speed. Um, and they do make a little bit of noise in the, in the winter time when they run a defrost cycle, um, you know, it, it's reversing the flow of refrigerant. And so there's kind of some gurgling or, or bubbling type noises usually um, as that happens. Uh, but I can say that it's much quieter than baseboard heat. If you, if you have old baseboards that expand and make pinging sounds and stuff like that, um, it's much quieter than that. Um, yeah, I've had a lot of customers ask questions about how loud they are, and you know, it really depends on what your, your frame of reference is. Um, so Efficiency Main has some incredible rebates for heat pump systems, um, and they've actually changed some in the last six months, so I won't go into a lot of detail, but typically they have a larger rebate for the first indoor unit and a smaller rebate for the second indoor unit and no rebate for any additional units beyond that. Um, and so uh, the, the rebates are often, I don't know, uh, a quarter or fifth of the total cost of the system. Uh, and, and they also provide information for vendors um, here on the bottom left of this, this particular screen on their website. Um, the last I heard from Michael Stoddard, who's the, the director of Efficiency Maine, they have more than 500 heat pump vendors in the state that are in their system. And uh, there's a lot of variation, um, just like anything, there's a lot of variation between different contractors. 
I highly recommend working with a reputable contractor, either, you know, talking to friends and finding out who they've worked with. Um, I, I worked for Revision Energy. I can highly recommend them. Uh, but there's a lot of companies around the state, but there's, there's some that are better than others. Um, and I would say that often you get what you pay for. Um, if you're spending more uh, or if someone has a higher offer, that usually entails more labor time on site. And it is really important for them to do a triple evacuation of the refrigerant lines. Um, that's where they pull a vacuum in the line and then pressurize it, I think to 500 PSI um, with, with nitrogen. And then, and then they evacuate the line again. And that helps to flush out any air bubbles that may be in, in a unit or in the, in the lines and make sure that the lines are really clear so that, the, so that there's just refrigerant in the line. Um, if, if it's not installed properly and there's bubbles of air in the line or that sort of thing, it can really cost efficiency in the system um, or, or cause, you know, if that air bubble gets to the wrong place, within the system, it can stop functioning altogether. Um, and so the installation is really important um, and it's worth doing right because there, in theory, if it's done right, then it only has to be done once. Uh, so anyway, e Efficiency Main does have a whole list of vendors. You can see who works in your area, um, but it's also worth you know, double checking on, on the quality of those vendors. Um, efficiency main also offers home energy loans. Um, and so if you don't have the funds available to pay outright, um, they offer loans up to 15 grand at a pretty affordable interest rate. Um, and they've been working to decrease their loan requirements. Um, Sarah, am I allowed to talk about legislation in this call today? Yes, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Uh, I've been, I've been ask, working. Apologize later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been working hard on a bill LD 1659 um, that will create a statewide green bank or uh, a statewide clean energy and sustainability accelerator to help improve financing options for efficiency, clean energy, and other climate solutions um, with the goal to make loans like this even more widely available. Um, especially to lower lower income borrowers who, who don't have income necessary for, for most loan programs um, or who don't have credit to be able to qualify um, for, for loans. And so um, it's modeled after the Connecticut Green Bank, which has been very successful in that area. And we had a good public hearing a couple of weeks ago and it should have a work session on the bill potentially this week. Um, yeah, there's some, there's some great legislation moving forward and, and the Sierra Club has been very active in the legislature this year. Um, so anyway, trying to improve the availability of loans for these types of projects. Um, so anyway, um, I wanted to do a shorter presentation and allow time for questions. So I'm, I'm happy to take any, any questions that you might have um, specific to your house can be a little more complicated, but I'll try. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. So folks, we, we're a small group, so folks just wanna say it. If they don't feel like comfortable saying it out loud, you can put it in the chat and I can read it for you. Um, and I guess just until we have some questions, I will go first, I have questions, but I'll start with just one, um, which is, I've been looking with a lot, at a lot of house houses that, um, you know, varying ages, but that have forced air heat. And is it possible, because the duct work is all there already to do, to swap that out for a heat pump, centralized heat pump? Um, for an air source heat pump, no. Uh, with a ground source, I, I installed a ground source heat pump in our house in Reno, which exchanges heat with the earth rather than heat with the outside air. Um, and with that, actually, that's exactly what we did. We put in a water to air heat exchanger that, um, that then had a blower and blew into the ductwork. Um, but I can say that for one, most ductwork is not worth reusing. Um, most of the time the ductwork has a ton of leaks in it and is uninsulated or very poorly insulated. Um, and so in an older home, ductwork can lose 25% of the heat that you're putting into your heating system. 
Uh, and then also uh, air source heat pumps are much less expensive than a ground source heat pump. So I, I wouldn't recommend putting in a ground source heat pump uh, in almost any circumstance. So typically I would say, no, it's not worth trying to reuse your duct work. Um, take the, you know, either hang on to that existing system as a, as a backup in case something happens to your heat pumps or, uh, remove that duct work and sell it to a scrap yard. Thank you. And, uh, Sue, I saw you come off uh, mute. Did you have something? Yeah, I did actually. So, um, one of the trickiest things in an old house, I think, is trying to find a place to mount a heat pump that doesn't have a window in it or, you know, it's just, it's not easy to, to do. And so I'm wondering about um, kind of innovative ways, like has anyone um, installed them uh, down low on a wall or, or has anyone stall, installed them perpendicularly in a, in a narrow space or, you know, just can you talk about sort of maybe some innovative ways to fit one in? Because as I look around my house, there's almost no place to actually put, mount, uh, literally mount a, a heat pump. Yeah, um, no, and that, that's something that we run into quite a lot. Uh, the, the floor mounted units are a, a different shape. They're usually about 18 or 20 inches high and, and two feet wide. And so those can go low on the wall at the floor level or six inches above the floor. Um, typically they don't recommend um, installing the, the, the regular wall mounted units lower down um, because they, the, the fan only comes up to horizontal. And so it has pretty poor air distribution um, if, if it's mounted lower on the wall. Um, the floor mounted units actually flow in the other direction. So they pull in at the bottom and then blow out through the top of it to kind of arc it up and across the room. Okay. Um, and I know that Mitsubishi offers floor mounted units. And I think that uh, probably Fujitsu and, and Daikin do too, but I, I can't say for sure. Um, probably most of the major manufacturers have that as an option. Usually they're a little bit more expensive, um, but versus having no place to put it. Um, and then people do get creative. If you look over Becky's shoulder, um, you'll see that hers is mounted in a corner and has some custom cabinetry around it to pull it out from the wall um, and angle it across the room. Uh, so, so there are options for, for getting, getting more creative with it in terms of locating it um, somewhere that isn't directly between two windows. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think what else I've seen. Uh, uh, I've seen some cases where the windows were far enough apart, but the window trim was too close. And so we just added a board across behind it to pop it out so they can just kind of, the, the unit can go across over the window trim on either window on either side um, to, to just try, you know, try to create a little bit of extra space. Clearly you don't want it to stick into the window itself, but you know, over, depending on your window trim, uh, losing an inch or two of, of that being visible is, can, be, can be an option. Right, are, are the floor mounted units as effective as the high up ones? Yeah, they're, they're pretty similar in terms of their capacity and, and the efficiency of them. Usually the, the efficient, the primarily the efficiency of a heat pump is due to the compressor outside. Mm -hmm. um, and so the actual unit inside has a much lower impact on the system efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead, David. Yep. Yeah, yeah. My <clears throat> David, my son's home has uh, got a um, baseboard hot water heating. So uh, could that system be matched uh, to a heat pump through a heat exchanger or something to at least provide supplemental? Um, I, I know that there are a couple companies that have been working on air to water heat exchangers to be able to use an air source heat pump and go into either a, a radiant floor or, um, or radiator system. Um, often those systems require a higher water temperature de depending on the type of the distribution. Some of those require a water temperature of 160 or 180 degrees, which you wouldn't be able to achieve with the heat pump. Uh, and so usually I see that, I've seen that with radiant flooring, um, but I, I, haven't, I haven't worked on any of those systems directly because we, the company that I was working for, we 
piloted a couple projects and found that they were a newer they were a newer company and that we had some supply chain issues and when we had to send our crew to a site three or four different times to you know install pieces that arrived late um, it wasn't cost effective for us um, and things might have improved since then or there might be other options um, but really like there it's a really straightforward design and and it's uh, having having the indoor unit that's designed to run refrigerant through it and the outdoor unit that's matched is really the most effective way to do it just having a mini split um, and then leaving the existing system alone as a backup heating system um, it's it's really hard to retrofit into old equipment and then you're dealing with you know questionable there, there's a lot of questions with the distribution system and the quality of it and um, and that sort of thing so having just a standalone heat pump system is usually best Any other questions? Jim, go ahead. This Jim? Yep. This Jim. Uh, all right, getting right back to the beginning, uh, I quickly see that we, if we were gonna go heat pump, we have a lot of work to do on our house to seal it up. Uh, half the house has an old field stone uh, foundation, which, I know is leaky. Uh, I'm 90% sure that none of the walls have any uh, vapor barrier in them. Uh, the ceiling on the second floor, the, the, you know, the floor of the attic, uh, doesn't have a uh, vapor barrier. Uh, what we've got up there are fiberglass bats sort of thrown around. and. Uh, I was just wondering what the what's the best approach to get going with sealing up the house. Oh, and and the picture of the of the of the I guess it was your basement uh, with the uh, spray foam on the walls and the vapor barrier on the floor. Can you walk on that vapor barrier? Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, I mean, it's not intended to be walked on constantly. Um, but you know, for the occasional use going down in the basement or the crawl space, yeah, you can walk on it or crawl around on it or that sort of thing. Um, so again, I recommend efficiency Maine has a whole list of vendors on their website. So you can see what companies work in your area. Um, and they have a ton of efficiency vendors as well as heat pumps. Uh, you can select the type of project that you're trying to do heat pumps versus efficiency or that sort of thing. Um, and you said you're in Bristol. Yes. Um, I know that Evergreen Home Performance is based in Rockland, and I'm pretty sure they do a lot of work down in that area. Um, they, the Evergreen Home Performance did the um, vapor barrier and spray foam in our crawl space, um, and so I can recommend them. Uh, but there, there's, a, there's a bunch of great companies around the state, um, and you may find that uh, some of them have longer lead times than others. Um, so in terms of getting it done before it's cold again, <laughs> Uh, this is, this is a good time to get started on it because you have a few months, uh, to line up the contractor and, and get the work done before, you know, we're swinging back in the winter time. Um, but yeah, the, the efficiency main website has a, has a link to, um, find a vendor and their website is just efficiencymain.com. Uh, and they, they're the best source. And the Efficiency Maine also has incredible rebates for air sealing and insulation and that sort of stuff. Um, so I think it's a thousand dollar rebate for your attic, a thousand dollar rebate for your walls, a thousand dollar rebate for your basement or crawl space. Um, and then I think there might be a $500 rebate for doing the energy audit and initial air sealing. Um, so the, the rebates certainly help and they can, they can in addition to providing rebates, they can also help direct you to a contractor. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Becky? I just want to mention that I my basement was done by Evergreen years ago, and I don't have a, pla a plastic floor. I have a rubber floor. 
um, because I use that space more. So I walk on, it's kind of got a honeycomb thing over top, under beneath the, um, the rubber on the floor. So, and then there are little trenches that um, we dug and put gravel in so that water can flow through and down to the sump well, and then it goes out. So, um, you know, it, it, it works that way, but it, I'll tell you, I'd never imagined the benefit of sealing the basement and the, particularly the sill. Um, I'd done energy efficiency work for years and years and years and years. And um, I had always recommended insulation in the attic and, um, but heat rises and it sucks in cold along the floor. And that is, um, you know, just, it's an astounding impact. If you do, did nothing else, it would make a big difference. So anyway, and I just want to introduce those two gyms to each other who live about a quarter of a mile from each other and are both friends of mine. <laughs> so. Uh, John, do you have a question? Yeah, um, <clears throat> looking at uh, introducing people to the idea of getting heat pumps in, I'm looking to see if you have sort of a rule of thumb, assuming that the space is well insulated and that there's decent interior circulation. Is there an approximate number of square feet that a single unit can cover so that someone can look at, okay, I'm gonna need two pumps for my 2000 foot house, et cetera? Um, not exactly. Um, there are some rules of thumb in terms of designing the capacity of the system. Uh, and so different heat pumps have different size capacity in terms of the heat output. Um, so our larger unit is 15,000 BTUs an hour and our smaller units are 6,000 BTUs an hour. Um, and I know that there are uh, other manufacturers, there's other units that have 24 and I think 30,000 BTU an hour uh, unit. So clearly the, the capacity of the heat pump system makes a big difference in terms of you know, how much heat you can get out of it. Um, and really the, the number of units in the house is, is usually more determined by the layout, the floor layout of the house. Um, you know, uh, to, if there's two floors in the house, typically having one upstairs and one downstairs, if, if you wanna be able to use it for cooling in the summertime. Uh, and, um, and so, yeah, I, I found that it's usually more driven by the floor layout and an old farmhouse that's chopped up into 10 different rooms uh, you might find that uh, you need more units just to be able to distribute the heat where you want it um, versus a newer house that, you know, has an open floor plan. Um, you might be able to heat the entire house with one unit. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? Um, I have an additional question that has been touched on. Um, servicing, how frequently do you get them serviced? That sort of thing. Any information on that? Yeah, so um, the indoor units have a filter that you're supposed to clean monthly, or I find that even with our cat, like I only need to clean it about twice a year. Uh, it's like you can look at it and see, wow, there's nothing on it or it's coated in dust. Um, and then cleaning the, the actual coils in the unit um, they recommend doing that annually, at least to start. And um, what I found is, again, our, our house is fairly clean. We, like, we just have one cat. And although he's been shedding a lot lately, uh, uh, if, if, there's, if your filter is getting clogged up, it's probably pulling stuff through into the, um, into the coils. And that dramatically reduces the efficiency of the system if it's trying to heat through a bunch of dust and fur and stuff like that. Um, and so having the coils cleaned once a year, um, when the technician came out to do ours, he was like, you can have this done every three years, like you're, you're in good shape. Um, and generally when they clean the coils on the indoor unit, they'll clean the coils on the outdoor unit as well. Um, and so, yeah, every, every one to three years and some manufacturers offer, or, or sorry, some contractors, some installers offer a maintenance plan where, you know, when you purchase the unit, you you can also pay for 10 years of service or that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, cleaning, cleaning the filters yourself. And most of them you can wash off in the kitchen sink. Um, pretty, pretty simple and, and pop them back into place. Um, yeah. If you're, 
if you have a bunch of animal, usually it's animal fur that's the worst. Um, but, or if you're doing construction projects, like turn the heat pump off or put a bag over it. If you're doing drywalling or that sort of thing in your house, um, you definitely don't want to suck drywall dust or, you know, those types of construction uh, contamination into the unit or, or you'll want to make sure to have it cleaned shortly after mm -hmm. um, because that'll similarly affect the um, efficiency of the coils and the, and the distribution of heat. David, um, we did a program on heat pumps a while ago, and one of the concerns people expressed was how cold it can get before their heat pumps can be useless. Do you have any opinion on that? Um, we've heated entirely with our heat pumps for the last three winters, and uh, I, live, I live in Morrill, about 10 miles from Belfast, um, a little bit inland from you, John, uh, but I mean, I've seen temperatures minus 12, minus 13 outside and our heat pumps were still keeping it 64, 65 degrees inside. And our, our usual set point is around 68 or 70. So usually what happens is you start to lose capacity, particularly, you know, if, if your house isn't as well insulated as it could be, you know, that's, it, it can't keep up with the amount of heat being lost by the house. Um, so usually what you'll see is a decline in temperature inside versus or like by a few degrees versus having no heat at all. Um, I think that there's a certain point where the heat pump will shut off. I, I think with the, the Mitsubishi units that we have, it's minus 18 or minus 20. Um, and there are different manufacturers that have different um, compressors with, with different capacities. And so generally that's a rating that the, that's based on the capacity of the compressor outside. Um, I think there are systems that are rated for minus 30, um, but I couldn't tell you where which manufacturers have, you know, the best compressors for, for really cold temperatures, like up in, uh, up in the county. You'd want something, you'd probably want something with a greater capacity. Thanks. Or, or the alternative is, you know, if you have a uh, propane or oil system to let that come on and, you know, it's how many days a year is it that cold out, you know, maybe in Fort Kent In Fort Kent is probably more than in Belfast. You know, but if you if you need to burn a couple of gallons of heating oil to get through that really cold spell, um, you know, it's well worthwhile if you're saving 500 or 800 gallons through the rest of the winter by using the, the heat pump system. Um, so we we generally recommend keeping the existing heating system, even if you're not going to be depending on it. Um, but Clearly there's homes like Becky's that work well without that. Um, I also helped my, my brother lives down in Topsom. Um, and he removed their oil boiler uh, entirely and they have one heat pump upstairs and one heat pump downstairs um, in a house built in the 1980s that they, I helped them re-insulate the attic and they also, they put new siding on and added an inch of rigid foam under the siding um, for, you know, continuous insulation in the walls. Uh, but, you know, yeah, heat pumps can, can be effective straight through the winter in, in most of Maine. I think if you get a further north in Maine or in the mountains, you'd want to have something to supplement just because it gets colder in those areas. But for the most part, you know, in most of the state, they can be 100% of our heating um, as long as we keep the power on. Maybe we'll make, we have so many heat pumps, we'll actually start having a cold winter again, which would be <laughs> nice. I, I provide, so I, my heat pump is in the, this is the, is the kitchen which um, heats, I have two stairwells, so I don't have anything upstairs. And it, you know, so it does the whole main part of the ha house. And then I have a wood stove in the attached barn addition that heats my living room and the two bedrooms upstairs from there, but um, I don't have to heat that. So I've, I've been very lucky and I'm in a pretty windy site. So um, yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm doing fine. And I really appreciate the, um, the, the maintenance that I've gotten out of um, revision. I think that is one of the things that I've heard from well, at least one or two of the other contractors. You wanna make sure that they're willing to come out and or for me, it's coming out onto a ferry um, to, uh, you know, to get out here and do maintenance. So being sure they'll make it is, is you know, an interesting challenge for some people. 
And I know it's one o'clock now. Any other questions? All right, seeing none. Uh, thank you, David, for so much for coming uh, and for giving us your uh, insight on the heat pumps. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is our last community conversation until the fall, um, but we have some already lined up. So keep an eye on our website. And if you get our newsletter, we'll be sharing information on those. Um, but thank you, everyone. <laughs>